Hey everyone, how are you doing out there? Uh, Scott is fixing his microphone. <laughs> Good evening. Okay, and uh, so uh, tonight's topic I think is going to be kind of interesting. And wow. next next week, if you guys are heads up right now, next week I'm going to flip flop it. So this week is what city preppers need to learn from homesteaders. Next Friday is going to be what homesteaders need to learn from city preppers. What? You can't change it up on me like that. No, that next week. That's going to be next week. So this week is what city preppers need to learn from homesteaders. Oh. And uh, so, so we're going to flip-flop it next week. And so we're going to be talking about, you know, who needs to learn what from who over the next couple of weeks here and what they have to share. But... Before I forget, I've got to put something up here real quick on my side screen here. Before I forget here, I can get down here because someone just told me, where's Minnesota? Holy moly, look at all those people already showing up. Yeah. Okay. Insert. Good and evening, we, everybody. All right. I got to go back up here to talk. Okay. Uh, was that? Uh, yeah. So homesteading engraving <laughs> is from Minnesota. What's up, Butch? So, um, I, I got a, I got a sheet of track, track all the cool, all the cool, all the good ones I work with and stuff. All the good ones. just about all the homes, all the channels I deal with. I got a tracking thing, what state they're from and stuff. That way, I, when they're talking about stuff, I, I can get my mind around where they are, what part of the country, is, and what's going on there, so I understand a little bit about um, the weather patterns and stuff. R A V. So, engraving business B U S S I N. I'm gonna try this microphone in, a, in the low spot tonight and see if it sounds any better. How am I, how am I sounding? Oh, uh, sounding pretty good here. And live. Okay, and that goes there. And Kathy's in the house. Yep, Minnesota, and that's Sarah. That's a Sarah with no H. Okay. Save that one. All right. Every time someone puts up who they are and stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and do a roll call here. No. Um, everybody, it's here. <laughs> so we have, uh, okay, the evil twin, of course, is first and in the shadows. Uh, Will at Just in Time Prepping. Butch hey, he's in the house. He's watching too. Yeah. What's up, Jake? And, Jake? and uh, uh, Courtney at Wide Family Farm. Uh, Sarah there at Hidden. Uh, I mean, at Homestead Engraving Business and Life. Jake Jacobs is here. The Fishes and Loaves Life. Michael Fifty Eight. Mama Z's Te Texas Kitchen. Uh, Mary Beth Smith. Enriched Refuge. Keith Kronk is here. Mama Z's. Uh, Teresa and Lee at Stringfield Ridge Farm. <laughs> Kathy, I'm catching up here. Good evening, aliens and humans. Man, it's got every time I think I'm caught up, it jumps. A bunch more put comments come in here. <laughs> All right, I think I caught everybody that's in, that's uh, has commented so far. It's in here, and then of course we also always have several that are just hanging out in in the shadows and not commenting lurkers. or anything. Lurkers. Hey, I love lurkers because usually I find up uh, lurkers lurk for a while and say, "Oh, oh, scan families here." They lurk for a while and then they, then they uh, um, recommend other people to come uh, check it out. All right, so. Uh, pop this back up here again. So this is the topic for tonight. And let me, uh, you know, and of course, I just, I just had to find when I was uh, looking for a good one. I just, you know, had, I found a bunch of the old uh, Ma and Pa kettle um, images and just had to put that up there. And yeah, there we go. I mean, I was, I I was young when they did uh, some replays of some of those on 
the uh, on NBC or ABC back in the early 60s. And my grandmother used to tell me all about, oh, this is a great show. You know, so, and it was pretty funny. <clears throat> all right. So let me go ahead and clear that off there. Yeah, the riot series. Yeah, that's for sure, <laughs> Keith. Yeah. I'm in Los Angeles. They had them, uh, They were blocking one of the freeways. Luckily, the freeway I take that we go to work doesn't go through those spots. Yeah. There's, you know, idiots will be idiots. Yeah, of course, the one where they have a lot of the idiots out with the freeways was up in Oakland, where they all go just walking up onto uh, 880 in the middle of commute time. And they're lucky there weren't a few grease spots there. But some of the things I was thinking about, and Scott, you can jump into some of yours, things that oh, that city preppers need to learn from homesteaders is about the biggest thing I can think of right off the bat. Number one is gardening. I and, agree with that. And, you know, it's like, all right, best planting dates, best crops for the area. You know, you're learning weather patterns. A lot of preppers don't think, and I don't, I don't want to offend preppers, but a lot don't think seriously about, ooh, I need to put a garden in where, you know, they're thinking about, oh, I'm going to bug out. I'm going to go up to the, up to my cabin in the, uh, that I, my vacation cabin. I have way up in the woods or wherever, and I'm going to live up there when everything goes, <clears throat> but they don't think about putting in a garden. Um, you know, what, what's the, what plants can grow up there? Ah, there we go. All right. Okay. Boom. There's another one right there. Uh, Seed saving and seed storage, very important. Okay, uh, D Dave's drop in. Uh, say hi before he goes to bed. He's not feeling well. So uh, everybody, and your prayers tonight, uh, keep Dave at Southern Ohio prepping in your uh, prayers. Uh, he's feeling under the uh, weather. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of farming stuff that I, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. City slickers don't get, <laughs> yet they're planning on being preppers and heading off and doing stuff. And in my mind, that's going to be the biggest problem for them. Now, there was, uh, was it this week or was it late last week? Uh, Jeremy at Living the Dream was uh, doing several things up there um, on his place up in northern Idaho. Uh, one of the things he did, he was doing was putting in some solar panels up, you know, top of some trees, cleaning uh, off a bunch of the, br uh, the branches and using the top of the tree as a pole for putting up solar panels. And one of the th comments he made was, wow, it opened this up. There's a lot more light reaching down here. And they were talking about their garden area and stuff and opening the garden area up for light from, you know, so they can grow stuff. And a lot of people that have cabins up in the woods don't think about that. But um, well, just for an example, um, it's been years, I'm ashamed to say, since I've done gardening. When I got married, my wife took over gardening <laughs> 30, 30 some odd years ago. She took it over and she wanted to do it. It made her happy. Uh, so I let her. Mama's happy. Everybody's happy. But, you know, I grew up, you know, as a kid, you know, we had, you know, a big garden. We had uh, blackberries uh, in permanently. We did um, corn. We did uh, all sorts of different types of squash, pumpkins, um, lettuces, um, all the, all the, you know, all the sorts of fun stuff and everything else. Well, I'm, I'm now relearning what I had forgotten over the last 30 years <laughs> from not doing it. And, and you know, I'm learning a lot of things, especially about best planning dates. Here's an example. Last Saturday. All right. Seven days ago. We got three inches of snow here in southern Idaho. <laughs> last Saturday, right? Last Saturday. Seven days ago. 
right now, let me click over here on this real quick. Let me skip away. How warm was it today? Uh, I'm looking here. It was, um, all right, it was 70, not 70, it's 79 right now. It was 84 earlier. Tomorrow, yeah. the high is projected to be 90. Yeah, Jeremy told me yesterday it was 85 up there in northern Idaho. Yes. So my uh, one of the guys I work with, he's, uh, he's the uh, tag man for the iron job I'm doing. And he went home last weekend for Memorial Weekend. He, was, he left, uh, he got up there Thursday morning. And he's like, man, I didn't get, I didn't get to do no fishing or hunting or nothing because because it snowed and rained all five days I was there. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. We were we were blazing down here, almost 100 degree heat last weekend. Well, last, yeah. yeah, last week when I was working on the Bobcat, which I still have to finish editing that editing all all those hours of video I did for three days, it started raining on me uh, during the last couple hours on what, last Wednesday. And yeah. it rained hard. Yeah. Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, snowed Saturday, then rained. You know, early the snow was when I got up in the morning. There was the snow. So over Friday night, Saturday morning, we got the three inches of snow. Yeah. Then it then it rained the rest of the uh, or most of the day, and fortunately, all the snow was gone. But um, my tomatoes, they're they're toast. Yeah. Uh, most of my corn that was already in its toast. Most of um, mo uh, all all but two of my Swiss chard plants are toast. So I got to replant Swiss chard. Um, however, with my setup on the on the uh, six um, totes that I did there in the end and stuff, that I had the lettuce, the romaine lettuce, the Grand Rapids lettuce, the the uh, Detroit beets and the spinach in because I had the netting over it to keep the cats from going in there and pooping in the, uh, in the, in the raised planter bed yeah. that, that it held up the snow off of the plants. Huh? So the plants, those plants all survived great. So what's so, your plan for a, 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 um, a greenhouse? <laughs> Why did my mind go blank on that? Why? What's your plan for a greenhouse? You gonna try and get one in by the end of the year, or for before next planting season, or what? Um, it all depends on what the wife wants to let go cash wise. Yeah, um, I would. Yeah, yeah. I I have a feeling we're not going to be able to put a will uh, a wallapini in until. Uh, the year before she she comes up, retires and comes oh, up. That's what you want to do? You don't even want to waste your time on it. Just a little temporary. Uh, I above. I've got I've been uh, pricing out um, materials. The everything from the four mil up to the ten mil thick greenhouse plastics. Uh huh. And the ten mil has some of the place things are giving it a five year warranty huh. against the sun. Um. So, what I'm about just going all together with like free stuff? Going on well, Craigslist and finding uh, old used windows. That's what I plan on doing. Yeah. I get started. I do not want to do a cobble together greenhouse. But what I can can do is I can I can looking at in one area, putting in a a couple of uh, high tunnels. Yeah. And then uh, making it so it's got like uh, what's called the clamshell ends on it. So the ends fold down and hit the ground and you just crank it up and you go in and you, you know, you go inside and work on it and stuff. And then, you know, everything can be taken down easily. And, you know, it, when, once we get through our wall of in and old school prepper just came in. Hey, old school. How's it going, man? Yeah. That scan family had some rain damage as well. Yeah. Oh, and I, uh, there were several videos last week. And the week before, different homesteads and stuff got hammered hard with hail. Yeah. Um, yeah especially in the Midwest, they had tornadoes down there, all kinds yeah. of stuff in the Midwest. I think, I think the Brichards um, yep. were showing damage and stuff, but they couldn't show the house because of insurance, you know, stuff. Right. Michigan, but, southern Michigan just got in it got flooded. Those two dams broke. Yeah, it's just, it's horrible all over. And, and that's the thing that, that, city preppers don't understand about their bug out locations <laughs> where they're going 
it most likely is going to get hammered with hard weather and they don't realize it. And there's a learning curve to deal with that hard weather to get your crops in, to get the a food grown and right. to get everything done so you, you can survive. Right. And, that, and not just survive, prosper. And oh, what's another word I was looking for? I can't think it just went, what would just jumped out of my mind, but you basically the proper and oh, thrive to, to prosper and thrive. And that's what homesteaders do. They prosper and thrive and, and, you know, you know, build up. And that's why I put up the, uh, if you notice above me here, you got the, uh, you know, the Ma and Pa Kettle movies and stuff to, and talking about, you know, how they were taking their, you know, in, increasing their, and making their homestead better and modernizing their old homestead. And that's what right. a lot of those movies were about. It's, and, and some of them are absolutely hilarious. And, prob, and what makes them so hilarious? <laughs> the true situations that actually happened to homesteaders on some sure. of them. So Celia said something interesting there. Um, and I was going to ask you about your title. You said what city preppers need to learn from homesteaders. So we're, so the, is the premise uh, to kind of flesh that out? Is that uh, city? We're talking about city preppers that are going to remain in the city. Are we talking about city preppers that both bug out both? Because even you know city preppers that remain in the city. I mean, one of one of the ones uh, that is learning a lot and is posting videos about what he's learning is Steve. Of course, there's trainer. Uh -huh. He goes, I don't know how he, he's saying he doesn't know anything about gardening, but have you seen what he's been doing this year? Learning and about gardening yeah. and putting stuff in. I mean, that's the thing. He's learning. He's been watching some of the homesteading uh, channels and he's learning yeah. and he's taking the steps. Right. And, you know, and that thing is, so what he's learning from the homesteaders and stuff, a lot of us need to learn from him on his for security and uh, self protection and all the you know the all the good training stuff he has from both as a marine as right. a, and as a um, uh, law enforcement officer in the penitentiary system. Because, right. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's kind of way the way I've I kind of looked at it. What you know everybody's familiar with with the show uh, Doomsday Preppers, right? And so it all they 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 portray preppers in a bad light, of course, as wackos and psychos and what whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I I loved the show because there was still a lot of legitimate good good quality stuff on there, um, as wacko as some of those people were portrayed to be. Um, the perception that I had about preppers when I first started kind of looking into this, probably, oh man, ten. 12 years ago was the prepper was the doomsday prepper, you know, a survivalist kind of uh, uh, get the ammo and your, and your MREs and your water filtration and get ready to hightail it to the mountains. And that was my idea of what a prepper was. Uh, and then, you know, as, as, as time went on, we became, you know, what I call our place here, an urban homestead uh, doing the urban homestead. And I really dove into YouTube with a lot of those channels that were doing the, uh, the hydroponics. They converted their swimming pools to a high, a completely self-sufficient hydroponics garden, greenhouse, uh, circular system. And they were surviving being completely self-sufficient off their little tiny postage stamp size piece of property. And I thought, now that is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. And having grown up on the farm and canning and having giant gardens and whatnot, because we were we were poor and a big, we were a large family and we were poor, we grew up canning all the extra stuff out of our garden and stuff. And so, I know, and I, I have always enjoyed gardening. I'm starting to get my try to get my Olivia into it, and uh, so, but, but we always grew more than we could eat. And we, I'm like, well, I'm not going to do all this work and give it away. Let's let's can it so we have stuff through the winter time. And so that was kind of our our uh, journey into urban homesteading because we weren't ready to leave the city but i had the other side the whole prepping side as well with the you know the ammo and you know all the survival gear in case something happened um but all of those skills we did here in the homestead or in in, in, in the city and a lot of i think a lot of preppers because of those shows and because of a lot of the youtube channels one of the other, uh, uh, one of the other people on here, I want to say it was Wide Family. Somebody made a comment about um, having watched shows about foraging in the city. I watched a whole bunch of those shows um, right here in the L.A. River Basin. People going down into the river and 
eating dandelions and fishing, which kind of sounds gross, you would think, but but the but the point being, make do and survive with what you have where you're at because you may not be able to get out of the city for a while. So I think a lot of the preppers, as a lot of the prepping channels out there are so focused, like you said, uh, Corsair trainers, they're so focused on the survival side of it, they don't think about the sustain the long-term sustainability, which a homesteader would do. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree. I think that's I think it's great that you're talking about this because I think I, I would say I would say that the city preppers have a lot more to learn from homesteaders. Like we've always we've always been saying for the last you know a couple of years is homesteaders, I think, are they really are preppers in their they're just they're preppers, they just don't know it. <laughs> yeah. They've been prepping their whole life. That's a way of life for them. That's not a yeah. not a, <laughs> and that's that's how I was, that was uh, trying to distinguish distinguish this between the mindset of you know that city preppers most of them focus on the um you know the MREs and the pew pews and you know you know all that type stuff and um. You know, and, you know, and like Steve, Steve is looking at gardening. He's got, he's got some really, I mean, he's done some really amazing stuff there in his place. And, and uh, the other one right now, um, from what um, Will said about bucket gardening, Tyler at just at uh, let's talk about prepping has a, uh, some great videos on his bucket gardening he's been doing and all the stuff he's, he's, right. he's in a little, in an urban area there and he's been putting in, doing a lot of gardening stuff and talking about stuff. And he, um, is real, you know, is, uh, he's kind of like, um, uh, 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 Martha here is talking about finds itself half and half, you know, He's he's a he's trying to he's trying to do it, get all the gardening stuff in and doing all the other stuff and being a prepper too. Oh, eh, eh, there we go. And he's you know he's doing a lot of cool informational stuff out there on how he's doing his gardening garden on a on a on a piece of property they're renting. Right. Yeah, there's no excuse. I've always said that to people. Mama Z's brought up a great point. She's got a garden in her, in her apartment. I said, yeah. When Olivia and I were first married in our first apartment and our kids were tiny, you know, we, we were in apartments for, oh, so we've been here for 20, 27 years. So seven years we were in apartments. We've had this place for 20 years. We've been married 27 years. So that's about right. Mm -hmm. Seven years in apartment buildings. I had planter boxes on the balconies to grow tomatoes and jalapenos. So I've always said that to people. You know what? It doesn't matter how small of a place you have. If you've got any place to put a pot, you've got a, you've got a garden. Yeah, and that's yeah, what I all the vertical gardening stuff out there is just amazing. What people are doing with that, you know? Yeah, and so. um, some of the plants I'm I'm planting, um, uh, some of the basil we got. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the ones. I'm trying to remember which ones it is. But on the seed packet, and I should have brought this up here. I didn't because I didn't think about it until just now, though. It says. 12, 12 inch pot, nine inch pot, six inch pot. It, it's, it, it says the smallest pot you can put it in to grow, you know, theoretically smallest. I've seen some, you know, little stuff says 12 inch pot. My mom used to grow it in a six inch pot or a four inch pot in the window. And she just kept it always, you know, as, as stuff grew, she you know, peeled it off. But you can, you know, you can grow a lot of stuff in, um, in in that uh, you wouldn't think you can grow indoors you can grow a lot indoors and yeah. um i was talking with my wife a couple days ago and i told her how well the lettuces are doing she goes pick it young otherwise you will not keep it'll, it'll get out of hand and you won't be you'll have you'll have lettuce coming out your ears right. and so that's what um um, uh, I'm planning on doing when I the lettuce starts getting up. Instead of getting big leaves of romaine, I'm going to pick tender, tasty baby leaves of romaine a lot so I can have salads. Now, for like of all the spinach I'm planting, um, I'm going to be, going to be um, like my wife's doing right now, the Swiss chard in California. 
Um, it's, she says it's it's getting away from her. She's basically she's she's picking it, blanching it, freezing it, st or stuffing it in, in a, into a, a quart zip. You know, hot water, cold water, stuffing it in a uh, quart ha and half gallon Ziploc bags and tossing it in the freezer. And it was what was a big pile of Swiss chard. Now it's a little little packet for dinner. And so that's what I'm going to be doing with the Swiss with the uh, Swiss chard and the spinach that I'm planting here. Uh, uh, meat packing plants where they have to work. Yeah, it's funny made a comment about people have made the comment a few times already about the meat situation. I know that's it's the the processing plants. Uh, our, you know, people were getting coming down with the the red dragon and the processing plants, and supposedly meat was uh, getting really expensive and scarce. But believe it or not, here in California, uh, we haven't had any shortages of meat. Uh, it it might have gone up a little bit in price, but I know bacon has definitely gone up in price. And um, but it, there's no shortages; it just has gone up a little bit in price. And then weren't you saying, Gil, uh, a couple weeks back about all the local uh, butcher shops? Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, the, all the, all, the all right. Here's what's happened here in Idaho, at least in southeastern Idaho, uh, because of what was going on in the Midwest with the meat, a lot of the meat processing plants shutting um, down until everybody was well. And I got a little personal thing about how. Yeah, well, oh, they're wearing gloves and, and masks while they're working. Well, yeah, but what about out in the parking lot when they're shaking hands and talking in the break room and not wearing their masks and gloves? But anyways, right. because they were shutting down, there was a ton, tons, thousands of beef and hogs and stuff that farmers couldn't do anything with. They had to, you know, you know, you know and some, I guess some states have, have laws that – once a pig reaches 300 pounds, you got to butcher it. Huh. Interesting. If, you, if, it, if it's going to be going for, um, for public use or whatever. Yeah. And they, they were, they were freaking, they were not able to get rid of it. Well, my neighbor across the street, the entrepreneur that he is, uh, he, he raises beef cow anyway and stuff. He and a couple other guys went together and contacted all of the butchers they could, you know, from, 75 miles north to 75 miles south of us here, mm -hmm. booked them up, then bought all this beef and brought it in from uh, the Midwest there, from Oklahoma and Kansas and that, and, and, and pigs and stuff, and brought it in and was getting it processed. And he, he, so, he said in three days he sold over 300 pigs right you know you know he had the, well, the appointments for the people did it boom 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 they paid for the butcher fee they paid him so much per pound right and um so you know and and right now we had we did uh, my daughter got an appointment with a really good butcher the cl the earliest appointment she could get and she did this a couple weeks ago well about a week and a half ago October 22nd. All right. October 22nd is the earliest date this guy had open. And so, yeah. And so right now we're, we're getting a uh, setting up for a black Angus steer to uh, take there. And we're going to get it purchased and uh, get it, you know, the, we're gonna pay the people to keep raising it and they'll charge us so much, uh, you know, like a dollar 25 per pound hoof weight when it goes to the butcher. Right. So Celia brought up a really good point that I wanted to I wanted to mention. If you were talking about uh, we're talking about butchering meat, and we're we're discussing uh, city preppers. So that's one. Uh, the city preppers obviously there's not much excuse for having some sort of a garden and trying to at least pro uh, grow some of your own produce. Uh, now meat's a different issue. Most of your city uh, most of your city property is not going to be large enough to grow. Um, well, you know what? You can have meat rabbits. There's nothing wrong with meat rabbits. There's no restrictions on that. I know right here in our place uh, where we're at, we can have chick. We're not supposed to have chickens unless you have a piece of property where you can have the chicken coop 50 feet from the house. 
Uh, honestly, the chicken coop that I have is probably about 40. <laughs> it's yeah. definitely not 50, but it's it's definitely in the far corner of the house, you know, and it's really not that big a deal, but it's a sanitary sanitary. It's it's the, I think it's overreach of government, honestly. But you're that's very, very common in most of the cities that you're gonna be in, unless your city, the, the plot of land that you have is gonna be big enough in pork. Of course, people in, in apartments are gonna have a hard time doing that. So uh the meat issue is gonna be difficult. Uh, we've had chickens, we've had eggs. We're actually going to be getting some more chickens here. And um, that's the only thing I think that would differentiate city preppers and trying to be self-sufficient as a city prepper versus a homesteader. But yeah. Now, um, uh, just uh, good, simple living just moved from Oregon to their wow. property up in uh, North Idaho, up there in um, Bonner County. Are they in Bonner? They moved from Washington to, and they moved to Bonner County. No, they moved to uh, Boundary County. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. I knew it was the, it, I didn't think it was Bonner. It's the next one. Okay. Next one. So, next one up. Um, now, in Washington, where they were at, uh, she has a lot of videos on the meat raising meat rabbits, and they were raising and butchering meat rabbits for years there. Yep. She's the meat rabbit lady. Yep. So, uh, good, simple living check and you want to learn about uh raising rabbits and stuff for meat check her out um like, <laughs> babysitting uh, huh fishes and loaves is gonna is Baby. gonna babysit some quail i <laughs> you know you know what let's just take that tangent for a second i don't understand quail i mean the the return on a quail the eggs are tiny so people eat them but Man, you gotta have a lot of them to make an omelet, and then the, the size of the bird. I've had quail, and you know, and they're tasty, but they're it just yeah. I don't know. There's just not okay. enough there. <laughs> now let's take that to the other side, where uh, my house in uh, California, where my wife and kids still, uh, my my wife and two sons are still at. The neighborhood around there has turkeys because there's a lot of parks and stuff nearby and then there's um uh, viano vineyards has a big big chunk of uh, land you know about a quarter mile away there are a lot of wild turkeys it'd mm. be very easy for someone to go get a turkey and raise it in their back yeah oh it's a wild one i don't know <laughs> you know how much meat oh. you get <laughs> you get off a turkey why why if you got wild turkeys why why even feed them if they're wild just you well, take them. <laughs> you, can't, you can't you can't hunt the wild ones, but if it's in your yard, hey Anthony, Anthony's here. Um, you. Hey Anthony, what's up, man? Yeah, you know, uh, so the wild the wild turkey, you know, if you had a, a turkey in their yard, your neighbors couldn't complain about it because they would think it was the wild turkeys. Now, also wild are there are several peacocks that are wild. Those are uh, noisy birds, and so. Yeah, they anyone, suck. anyone around our neighborhood in the city that ha the city that has chickens, nobody complains about it because they're not as loud as the peacocks. Nobody they're complains if anybody's a rooster. Ro well, the thing is, even with the roosters, they're nothing compared to the peacocks. Yeah, right? No, for sure. So we so, deliberately didn't get a rooster just to keep them, just so we didn't, you know, piss off our neighbors. I mean, they're yeah. still pretty loud, but not like a rooster. Yeah. Five in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey Anthony, if you can, I, I email I sent you sent you the email with the link, you know, because I think you'd be really good on information for providing what you know things you've learned, you know, setting up your uh little homestead there, <coughs> stuff that you needed to learn and from uh that city that city preppers would need to learn. Now, Anthony at Palmetto Prepared is has some really good videos on cooking. This guy loves to cook. I mean, he's made he's made um, you know survival pizza dough. Oh wow! And, yeah, and he's that you know you know what he goes like. If you, all right, if you don't have the the yeast and stuff, and you're in a survival situation, you can still make a pizza. And he had a video on how to do that. I mean, it was it was really cool. And hmm. he's done all sorts of breads and different types of breads. Really great channel there, guys. So that's Prometo prepared. Uh, fishes and loaves. Like, do you guys have wild peacocks in your area? Where the heck do you live? 
Fishes and Loaves, you're down in Florida, right? Yeah, North Florida. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's why they have them down. Yeah, they have them down there. Yeah. They and taste like chicken. He's asking. <laughs> I don't. I've never had a peacock. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of things that city preppers need to look to the homesteaders to learn for stuff they can do a in the city where they're at yeah. on their property and then <laughs> okay. all right anthony is he, ever, is he ever camera fresh dry or wet <laughs> and um even and, and more importantly for those that are planning on bugging out or um relocating temporarily for a season or so to wherever uh, they are going to, to learn about raising food in that area. Guinea hens are told the loud. Oh, yeah. Yes. There are, there are some chickens that are just absolutely obnoxious. Now my mother loved her, uh, her bantams. You know, like the miniature chickens. Mm -hmm. um, not very loud. Even the roosters, the Bantam roosters were not very loud. Now, the other ones we had, um, oh, she's in South Florida. Okay. Right. Uh, there's, um, that was, uh, that was uh, Fishes and Loaves that I was talking about, South Florida. Okay. So, um, but we had some, uh, uh, some what are called super chickens. It was a, a breed that were bigger than Rhode Island Red. They're bred from Rhode Island Reds. And got huge. Huh. Uh, surprisingly, that rooster never crowed early in the morning. Sun had to be up for an hour or two before he'd crow. <laughs> well, right. yeah, everyone else was awake. Oh, but, that's great, fishes and loaves. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> they are loud. I've heard them. Okay, and uh, Courtney says uh, they have Polish hens, <laughs> and the rooster is loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Canning, canning is absolutely vital. I, I, I believe canning is completely vital to, uh, to both prepping and home setting. I mean, it's just, it's just, it just has to go with it. We're, I mean, the whole point of this all is to, to be self sufficient, buy as little from the store as possible. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that um, I have learned urban homesteading. Uh, most people who live in the city have a full time job. They're not homesteading and and, and providing for their own. Right? They, they got a mortgage and they're they they have a job. So if you're going to try and start doing homesteading stuff, you're going to go to your nine to five or or in my case, it's sixty hours a week, and then come home and try and garden and and can. My apple tree right now, I have, uh, I forget the, 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 the variety. It's, it's a warm weather variety, but the, the apples are just about due. And they're, my, my, my branches are hanging really, really low because they're full of fruit and they're getting really big. We Do really should. Horse, prop them up. Well, I did. I'm propping a bunch of them up. But after working 50 hours, 60 hours a week, kind of like the last thing you want to do is come home and can, you know, 50 pounds of apples and make applesauce. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's man. one of the things is all the work involved and, and yeah. preppers need to be prepared for that all the people that are escaping the city and fleeing yeah. uh, I think there's a lot of people that have that misconception that I'll just go out to the homestead and start you know working it's going to be you know a lot easier no it's it's a lot of work very satisfying yeah. but all the work involved with homesteading yeah now um, my mom was born in 1922 so she was a child of the depression mm, yeah and so she, uh, a Pennsylvania prepper. Uh, so my mom, um, she grew up, you know, being in the depression era child of working 12, 16 hours a day to get by. And so, um, she, uh, her stepfather owned a catering company for the motion picture studios. Oh wow! He had to be out there at on the on the um, the shoot at six o'clock in the morning making breakfast for the crew. Yeah, so they're up at two or three in the morning. And then she would make um, do lunch, 
generally they did not have to do dinner because they cut, you know, but sometimes they would also do dinner as well. And um, what when she, she would get home, then she attend the garden at home. And I remember the, the, the time frame when she was doing this was when we did a lot of canning. Mm. I mean, we can, we, we, we had a, uh, had a, a place where we could go get pears and peaches and we got flats upon flats upon flats of pears and peaches. And we can't, we well, basically, we had so many pears, we were canning them not in quart jars in half gallon jars. Wow. That's amazing. A lot of them. I love canned pears. Oh, my favorite yeah. thing. And, um, so, I mean, it was up. Here's Anthony coming in here. Let's see if he's coming. Hey, whoa, Anthony. There he is. Got even more on there. <laughs> and howdy, howdy. Wow, you clean yeah. up nice. And so um, <laughs> my mom grew up, I mean, grew up, you know, in the Depression. When she was, when she was, uh, and we were living in the city down there in Burbank, California, and right across from the Burbank airport. And we still had a garden. She was working 12 hours a day and still we canned a boatload of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So Anthony, spotlight on you. <laughs> What's that? All right. All right. So when you bought your property that you're on now, what was the learning curve for growing stuff there? Well, the first thing I grew up in South Carolina, so it wasn't that big of a deal coming out here to learn how to grow things since, you know, I grew up with my grandfather, you know, show me how to grow stuff. But um, there's one thing about geographical South Carolina that a lot of people don't know. And that's the, what's called the fall line, because way back when, when, you know, the, uh, global warming was at its peak and the beach was actually halfway up South Carolina's coast. So they call that the, uh, the sand hills. Well, if you're above that, you have a drastically different climate than below that. And all my experience was below the fall line. So having to, to try things in my area was a little bit different, um, but not too bad. The main issue that I had that I've been dealing with since I bought my property has been uh, the regulation, like, how do I put it? Um, I live rural now, right? And you can basically do whatever you want to do here. Um, growing, like, if you want to grow your own, like, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I got my mind going too fast for what I'm actually trying to talk about. <laughs> uh yeah. If I wanted to, to plow out 20 acres, I totally can if I have the ability to. However, as part of the extension, you have to tell them what you're actually planning. And so they coordinate a certain area. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like uh, the factory farms in the area have to know what you're planting so they can spray accordingly. Because with the GMOs and all that crap around here, uh, when they try their little test gardens, if you are putting something different here, they'll – tell you to stop does that make sense yeah okay so so they don't they don't want cross pollinations or something or i didn't realize the the politics involved in that so if you're going to be putting big giant i mean a small garden is not a big deal but if you're going to be planting you know an acre worth of something they, they're going to come inspect it does that make any sense yeah wow really sort of like it uh, uh yeah uh, uh, a homeowners association that you didn't realize you're getting like, involved with. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's hard to explain to people, but like, it's not like they're going to come and find you or anything like that. Uh, it's just, you know, you have to be aware if you're moving to a certain area, the certain things that you may be moving into. And that's one thing that caught me completely off guard. I was like, wait, what? So wow. it's just something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So, Anthony, what do you think are some things that city preppers need to learn from homesteaders to get by both in the city or if they bug out? Um, well, the first thing that I would like to tell any urban or city uh, prepper, homesteader, someone wants to do it, is you need to work out your kinks now. Uh, 
because a lot of times, and you'll see this on a lot of other channels, like big channels videos, where they have a whole bunch of seed packets and they say, oh, I'm good. I'm ready to go. When in reality, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, like, you need to learn what works in your area first off. And you need to learn the, the intricacies because I remember when I first, I was still in the military, the, excuse me, I was still in the military at this point. And uh, I didn't realize that there was a such thing as cold weather and hot weather crops in my state. Cause you know, when I was out all over the country, you know, people were like, oh yeah, I'm growing spinach right now. It's the middle of July. Cause you know, they're from Wisconsin and they can do that. Well, you can't do that in South Carolina. Uh, your spinach will bolt and die and, half the stuff just doesn't work after it gets 90. So uh, you have to learn that. And I planted a whole bunch of broccoli in like May. And I wondered why I failed so bad. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I, I know listening to some of the, the some of the prepper channels that, um, you know, you, you talk about the big ones and stuff. They're not really planning ahead and they're not doing what they need to be doing now to get the practice and the experience Yeah, uh, because they, Oh yeah, I got three years supply of dehydrated food and I got another two years of MREs. I'm going to be good. I have plenty of time to learn. Yeah. Yeah. So, because all, all those doomsday city slicker preppers are fleeing the cities right now and they're going out there trying to homestead. They're all going to end up on a, on an uh, episode of homestead rescue. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there, just in case Jeremy's watching. <laughs> just in case he's he's working. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to one one thing I wanted to clarify real quick. Um, it's not like they tell me what I can and can't plant. It's just if I'm going to plant something over an acre, I would they would prefer I let them know just in case they have their test gardens around because they have test gardens all over my area. So it's just. It, they come by and look and see if there's any pollination issues or whatever. They don't tell me I can't grow something. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is like, this is the first summer that I'm actually doing a garden here in Idaho. Now my daughter tried to do one, uh, has been doing one for a couple of years now. And you know, like I said, like I said earlier, last Saturday, seven days ago, we got through in the, in Saturday morning, there was three inches of snow out there. Tomorrow, the forecast is 90 degrees. <laughs> yep. Talk from about from the the summer. Spring. No in between. <laughs> yeah. And that, like, yeah. That happens it, here in February. Yeah. And so um, we had some nice warm weather for the last couple of weeks. I, you know, I had the, um, the spinach in, the rain lettuce in, the, um, the beets planted. I actually had had. In my 55 gallon barrels out there and my tubs, I planted, had planted the carrots. I had uh, put out Swiss chard, um, planted corn out there. I put out the, um, the borage, uh, had, you know, the, so I've been growing in the basement, planted it out there, put the tomatoes out there, and then bam. <laughs> it's like, you know, tomatoes are all dead. I'm growing. I'm starting another set there. I'm gonna wait till they get a little bit bigger before I put them out again. But yeah, it's just things you you have to learn about the your your not your area or the area you're going to. Because I know a lot of preppers have. Oh, I got a um, we got a cabin up in the woods, whatever. And we're gonna go up there. But there's a lot of things that homesteaders can teach preppers about gardening and then there's the other thing besides gardening there's hunting there is um, uh, livestock raising because you can't do too much livestock raising in the cities we were talking about that you know rabbits chickens but you know not too much goats sheep um, cows you know whatever pigs you know you can't do too much of that in the city yeah, but uh, a lot of them are planning. Oh, when I go out there, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in. I'm gonna put have you know, s you know several cows and hogs and goats and yeah. stuff. And it's like, uh, what do you know about it? Well, I got books on it. I love how everybody in the chat is following along the conversation. You guys are great. You guys are you guys are 
uh, you guys are all tracking and you guys are, are, are like progressing to the next point. And that's the next point what Celia brings up. Uh, and then somebody just asked you, uh, Gil, homestead engraving. That's kind of like the next point is, well, what grows in your area? Well, let's talk about zones for a second because I never paid it. I never knew nothing about zones. I will be right back, but I'll be listening. Okay. Um, the zone I'm in, uh, in Southern Idaho, it's, it's broken up down here. So we got, um, 5A, 5B, 6A. And depending on which map you're looking at, I'm either 5B or 6A or 5A. So it's like, you know, and the way the weather goes, I we, we, we figure we got to count on being 5A for most of the stuff we plant. But, um, yeah, but well, the, all, the all of a sudden, back boom, right, right now we're got 90 degree weather. So, <laughs> So the main drawback of that, and I don't know if she's still in here, but Martha and I are the same zone, technically. Uh, she's 8A in Oregon, and I'm 8A in South Carolina. Yeah, There's a drastically different summertime, and that's the thing that uh, zones only you know, talk about cold or freeze. Basically, it's for frost hours because I'm not sure how many people in here know, but certain uh, – Trees, fruit trees especially, require what's called chill hours to produce blooms. So you need to have a certain minimum amount of chill hours depending on what you're planting. So if you want to have peaches or plums, you're going to have to have between 600 and 1,000 chill hours to make sure that peach tree reliably produces blooms. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, why don't you just plant the lowest amount of chill hours possible? Well, if you do that, then the plant's going to start flowering. It's going to start opening up way too early and the frost is going to kill everything. So you have to pay attention to what zone you're in. So you know exactly which tree to plant. That way you're not going extremely, uh, you know, your, your plant's not waiting until middle of May to start putting leaves on, or it's not waiting until January 15th and putting leaves on. So you kind of got to know what zone you're at. So that way yeah. uh, you can plan accordingly. And unfortunately with the way that the climate's been going in the last couple of years, people that are in like eight B or eight A are, st are slowly changing into eight B. Like we're moving back a little bit because it's not getting quite as cold these last couple of winters. Yeah. One of the things though, that uh, I did with the trees that uh, my daughter and I have planted out there. Uh, she's planted four, um, apple trees, and I planted a wal walnut and an apricot tree so far. Um, I wrapped them um, uh, back in uh, November when they after they'd gone lost everything. I wrapped the uh, the trunks up to the first branch with a white um, wrap tape stuff, which a insulates against uh, heat. And um, reflect, you know, reflects the heat stuff, so the trunk does not get warm, so they don't blossom too early. And yeah. don't they also stop, uh, like, the voles and whatnot from chewing, like the borers? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it stops some of the stuff getting into the into the uh, the trunk there. Yeah. Well, my son-in-law, in his infinite YouTube wisdom of watching the oh. Paint, you know, join my club and I can tell you exactly how to do things, but it'll only work if you join my club uh, channels. <laughs> um, went out there and as soon as the, the, the ground started to thaw, pulled it all off. And I didn't realize he'd pulled it all off. I go out there. It's like, uh, what the heck happened to all this? Because everything was now and started to bloom. And it's like, uh, you know, oh, we're all going to get all, all the stuff now. It's blooming now. It's good. It's uh, you, that, you know, the freeze is over. That wasn't for the freeze. That was for the sun to keep from doing it. You know, you should have asked before you pulled it off. And so basically what happened, the, the uh, apricot tree went and all the um, uh, blossomed out and everything. And then sure as, as the, all the neighbors had said, about three weeks later, the heavy winds came through. And or two weeks later, came through and just all those you see all the blossoms blowing up. So we may get one or two apricots on that tree where it should have been loaded. And the same thing with uh, and the apple trees that that, that there are apple trees out there went and a lot of their blooms blew off. So the only one that didn't bl blossom out early because the weeds had come up around it and protected it 
from the sun was the walnut tree. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, that same extension I was telling you about with all the test gardens, I've actually been in very close contact with them about fruit trees and what I can plant. They've been a really good resource. And I have gone through probably four or five different sets of trees to see what works in my area because whether it's either, um, unfortunately, I either have not enough chill hours, which I learned with one apple tree. Uh, I get too much rain in a certain location and the roots didn't like all the water that was building up for my plum trees. And uh, my peach trees were murdered by deer because they wanted to hit their you know, antlers on there and yeah, rub them. Yeah. They broke it in half and uh tree didn't survive after that. Cause it was right in the middle of winter time. So I just couldn't, couldn't bounce back. And uh, so I learned the hard way basically on what I can and can't do. And then with my other apple tree um, two years in a row, I had massive aphid infestation. Uh, apparently the aphids really like apples here. So yeah, I learned that one the hard way as well. And that's the thing which you know, most preppers don't look into as far as finding out, you know, you said you got a resource, you know, with, with the uh, uh, that organization for finding out what trees are, are better and stuff. Um, fortunately, here where I'm at, um, up in Idaho Falls, there's a place called Town and Country Nursery. And they have classes every Saturday on different topics and stuff. And they talk about the growing seasons. They got newsletters they send out. And they they are big on educating everybody around when to plant, what to plant, which type of trees are are best in the area, and then of course you know the um, University of Idaho Extension Program puts out tons of information, not just for over by Boise where it's located, but for the whole state what trees will grow best as well, and which ones you know to plant, not to plant, where you can plant. Um, stuff like the elderberry and stuff and you know, stuff like that and so those there are a lot of resources out there but i never hear any of the big prepper channels talking about these resources to gain information about where you're going you know where you're at to grow a garden where you're going to go to to grow a garden and well, that to me is the, big, is the biggest fail of city preppers is not getting the skills ahead of time. Be careful. Don't get your uh, microphone there wet, uh, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> what are we looking at? <laughs> and There's a reason for that, Gil. There's a very good reason why they don't tell you that stuff. And, uh, and I, I, I think you know the answer. Uh, you just might not want to say it out loud. Um, mainly because they don't do what they talk about. Yeah. So... There's a lot of channels out there that don't walk the walk. They pair it, they pair it off each other, and they can speak hypothetically when it comes down to a lot of things. But if you ask them to go out and actually describe to you how to even transplant a tree, they'll kind of give you like what? Mm -hmm. Or how can you tell when a you know they talk about oh I'm going to be hunting for all my food, and you ask them simple questions on how to a spot if you know you have game on your property, what things can you look at? And they go uh you put out a camera. No, nah, man, that ain't it. What? So. You're suggesting there are fake homesteading channels, are there? Fake prepper channels. I wouldn't say that ever. <laughs> like I said, they don't. They they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And yeah. unfortunately, and, and that's unfortunate. Even with some of these, from not these, some of these gardening channels that my son-in-law likes to watch, I can tell. I, mean, I was listening to it. It's like. That guy's full of crap. That's not how you make biochar. Because he was trying to make this little itty bitty you know, thing. I was like, no, no. We go out there. We have the huge burn pile. Fine. We get the big stuff burning first. And then we throw the little stuff on. And you, then you use the, the, the metal rake to start raking your biochar out and hit it with a hose. You don't wait. You don't try to do a little cup at a time. And it's like on the piles I had out here, I had probably two uh, wheelbarrow full of biochar material from big bonfires because I hit it with the water and then uh, knocked out the small stuff and moved the big stuff around. And, you know, you know, anyone that he's got, Oh, but he says the only way you can make it is this little small batch at a time. And it's like, uh, well, gee, go watch Howie or, um, 
Uh, well, some of the other ones, you know, how food forest per permaculture talks about making uh, uh, biochar. He doesn't talk about making baby uh, batches at a time. It's you make enough. Show me the botafides. That's right. Yeah. Had a question. <laughs> you guys are talking about zones and stuff. Um, and Anthony, you were saying that you were kind of terming it more towards uh, the, the whole tree thing. And that's something that I, you know, I had to pay attention to. My whole yard down here, I'm a firm believer that uh, trees are, are only ornamental to a point. When you got limited space, like I do down here, every single tree, if I'm going to put time and energy into my tree, it's going to give me something back. So everything in my yard, it, it right. produces. So I've got the warm weather apple, the, the, the um, what else do I have? I have a pear and I have the uh, the plum. I have an avocado. I have an orange and macadamia nut tree. And um, so those are the very, very applicable uh, issues for me. Having because I wanted apples down here in Southern California, but you only get a you, very you don't get chill down here in Southern California. So what apple is going to do good down here? But uh, I know I'm going to be able to do great things in North Idaho with apples and everything and cherries and everything else. But I am not going to go to North Idaho without my avocado, my macadamia, and my orange tree. I have to have those trees with me in North Idaho, and it's not a zone whatever this is down here for those trees up there. Yeah. <laughs> So okay, that's what what I, I got to create that zone in a wallapini like Gil's going to do. So, well, that's, that's what my mom did when we moved to the north rim of the Grand Canyon for two years. She took her fig tree up there, and in the winter time, we got bales of straw and built a, um, I don't know what you want to call it, basically three sided uh, wall thing, and then put plastic huh. over the entire thing, and wow. we had all her. Uh, warm weather stuff in there, and we then we put a couple. We put had the uh, the uh, was it the C7 uh, Christmas lights, not the big ones, but the uh, the smaller ones, like a nightlight size, you uh, know, just one. enough to warm it up a little bit, exactly to keep them oh, keep wow. them from it. And it survived, it survived for two years out there with snow on it. I mean, heck, the last year we were there, 1975, uh, March 31st. It was like 67 degrees out. Next morning, April 1st, I remember because it was an April Fool's joke by Mother Nature. We got three feet of snow overnight. Yeah. Anna Apple, and, you're right. It is. It's Anna Apple. That's right. That's the one I have in my yard. Yep. And so, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there is ways to, to, to move and grow the warm weather trees, the figs. The, or, the citrus and stuff in cold weather, but you just got to know how to really take care of them for the winter time so they don't freeze. And right. uh, well, that's the big thing. And a lot of people don't, they don't know that. And if you, you talk to your extension, a lot of times on the, on the websites, the extension say, Oh, you can grow this, this, and this, and this here, but they don't go into the detail unless you talk to them about like, okay, okay. So I can get apples here in South Carolina. That's pretty cool. Oh wait, I have to have a, a very, hardcore spraying regimen because the bugs here will destroy every apple on your tree uh, by yeah. May or June. So they don't tell you that part unless you ask them. So that's kind of one of those things. Same with uh, personal with figs. I can grow figs. I have figs. Um, see you later, Will. But there's two different types that in my area, because remember how I mentioned the fall line uh, being able to, the climate's almost drastically different above the fall line. Well, that's one of those things. Um, the fig that I planted, I planted the uh, brown turkey fig, and I really should have gone the Chicago hardy fig because we get that just a little bit more cold, and it happens a little bit later than the brown turkey fig is good for. So about two out of every four years, that brown turkey fig opens too early, you get a late frost, and then it basically kills it back to the ground. The yeah. roots are still fine, but that tree can never grow the way I need it to because – I saw the website, hey, you can grow brown turkey figs all day. I didn't look at the, you know, yeah. the little details. And that's kind of one of those small little experience things. Oh, and Jeffrey, I'm in South Carolina, so I'm on the East Coast. Yeah, uh, Jeffrey, what part of the East Coast are you are you looking for, north or northern states or southern states on the East Coast? Because I know there are several others. Um, who else is back there? Um <laughs> Ah, uh, having a interesting wide. Thanks yeah, and there there are there are several other ones. I mean, Anthony, you're in South Carolina. Yeah. Okay, I can't remember who's in North Carolina. 
and there was somebody uh-huh. else that's, up, that's in Georgia. Um, see who's in. And then there's um, somebody is in Kentucky. There were several that are in Kentucky that were on er, on earlier on uh, Stringfield Ridge. Uh, Stringfield Ridge Farms Live is on start, is on the hour before mine, and the hour before that, Jeffrey is Mimsy's Garden. Those are two uh, really good um, uh, homesteading channels to check in on here um, on Fridays before mine. <laughs> See, Cecilia's got a, a three story cherry tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I wish I could uh, I could grow down here. But apparently in South Carolina, I can grow the sour cherries no problem, but the sweet cherries uh, they don't they don't make it here, which is yeah. kind of unfortunate. Yeah, I think what really lit my fire for bringing my warm weather plants with me to Idaho was watching uh, that that old guy Fitch up in North Dakota. Uh, I think just about everybody's most everybody's seen that guy's videos by now. Uh, it was what's her face, Kristen Dirksen, whatever her channel. Yeah, yeah. She highlighted, and you go look up that guy, uh, old Finch Citrus Grower, North Dakota, and this old guy is you know ninety years old. I love talking about that guy, and he's growing these biggest, fattest. He's growing figs, oranges, and lemons in North Dakota, where it gets thirty below. Well, if he can yeah. do it, I can do it. Yeah, <laughs> and and she, do yeah. <laughs> she also had uh, Kristen also had did that video on the uh, post the retired postman in. Uh, Kansas with a with that huge wallapini, where he has the banana tree. Is that is that a new one? No, that's that's the other one I usually show. Oh, um, I haven't seen that one. I can't yeah, believe that. That's um, uh, yeah. Uh, let me put this up over here, and you I will get show off it. a big old tangent talking about her her channel. <laughs> she got some yeah. great stuff. Okay, so um, the. Uh, Yes, she has some real, some real, a lot of good stuff on interviews, a lot of preppers and stuff, and um, farmers and stuff on her stuff, and comes up some really good stuff there. I'll, I'll look uh, for it if you can find um, it. Yeah, I'm going to put it up here right now. Uh, give so me a second here. I got everybody's put up some really interesting information and kind of this whole this whole subject uh, uh, area that we're talking about, and people are talking about books. They're referencing books, they're referencing zones, they're referencing all kinds of information. I'm going to say another differentiation between city preppers that they need to learn from homesteaders. And a lot of these people are obviously homesteaders. The homesteaders seem to know they're crap. <laughs> How many city preppers, they only research where to get their ammunition, their guns, and their bug out bag. They don't yeah. do the research like we're, like what everybody, everybody else here already knows, right? All right. Yeah, so I threw that link in there. Fantastic. Uh, there's the link, and the name of it is Nebraska Retiree Uses Earth's Heat to Grow Oranges in Snow. And this is the big wallapini uh, in Nebraska, and his, Nebraska. House is, his house is heated the, heated and cooled the same way as the wallapini is. That's right. And he has banana a banana tree in there. He's got uh, citrus trees. North Dakota. Yeah, he's all got those northeastern states. states. Look, look at look at look at those. This is in a state where he gets, you know, you know, below zero temperature. There, there the, the guy is, and you know, just look at this stuff. I mean, and this is you know a, a, a summertime shot of it. Yeah, and that's the wallapini, and yeah. you go, uh, look at the ornamental flowers in there and stuff. You know, but yeah, so most you know most people don't. Let me go back over here. Okay, get that down so I don't kill off my uh, – start going yeah, guys, if, on everybody. Uh, as some people are saying interesting, like they haven't seen that guy. Um, yeah, guys, I would highly recommend you guys all go watch that guy. Um, it's not North Dakota. It's – where is it? Kansas. Kansas. Same, he's, no, he's no, in, no. The, the one you just showed. Kansas. No, that guy's not in Kansas. That's Fitch. That's Finch. He's not in Kansas. He's in North Dakota. Or no, uh, the one I just showed. That's that is. He's. A, it says. I'm not kidding. I can't. Nebraska. Sorry. Nebraska. Nebraska. He's up yeah, in Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah. Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys haven't seen that guy, 
man, he, he's the guy's like 90. And that was that, that that video was done like four or five years ago, I think. And and he's busier than heck. He's working like he, he didn't retire. He goes, Yeah, I can't retire. He says it right in the video. Great video, guys. Absolutely great video. You yeah. guys will love it. Can't recommend it enough. Yeah. The, Absolutely, uh, Martha. Absolutely. Because uh, it's it's kind of funny how there's a lot of people out there who look who look to ask good <laughs> questions. And it's very hard to find good answers on some of these channels because just yeah. because you have a lot of subscribers doesn't mean you're a you know you know your stuff. It just means that you know you're really good at talking a lot of times or you were early. So you know, yeah, it's kind of funny how that works. <laughs> Well, I guess old school prepper is going to take us into the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, compost. so how many compost? Do you yeah. Compost. <laughs> yeah. And, and what's interesting talking about thing about composting, um my mom uh, my wife and my mom forever have had a bucket on the kitchen sink and everything went in there. And then it went out into the compost pile. Right. Um, my um, my wife, I got uh, Cos Costco years and years and years and years and years ago, had this big old ball that had on a stand. You can roast, spin it this way and spin it that way and spin it in whichever way. You open up the top and you put your compost in it, put it in there and spin it and throw a few worms in there. And that thing was absolutely fantastic. Great. And uh, when it it got so full one time she couldn't hardly turn it so we took it off she just pushed it or pushed it around the yard because <laughs> it wouldn't turn right she couldn't push it hard enough to make it turn in the stand it was in so it went on the ground and got pushed around the yard but you know compost you i know a dirty it, secret what um i don't actually compost the traditional way that most people think when you hear compost i don't I don't ever put in a tumbler or have like two different beds. Uh, one thing that I've realized that works really well for me is I just dig a trench in one of my raised beds and throw my garden waste or my, my kitchen waste in there, cover it up. In two weeks, the worms take care of it for me. So I don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what along the line. Uh... Okay. Okay, uh, hang on here. I'm glad you said that, Anthony, because I'm I'm not the traditional composter either. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to. I'm a lazy here. composter. <laughs> All right, hang on. You said cool. put, put the link up in the chat. I already. Oh, I already oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, here I'll throw that link up one more time here, guys. Yeah, there it is. There's the link to that video. Oh, one more time there. Okay, yeah. The, now back when we were on on the. Uh, the big acre and quarter uh, lot we had there in uh, well, my mom's place, we actually built a compost pile that was uh, 12 feet by 12 feet. Yeah. And uh, she, uh, we had plywood up on it and we had the drain pipe with the holes in it placed in there. And we had stuff from the cows going in there, the chickens manure would go in there. Everything would go in there. In the fall, everything from the, all the um, um, squash plants, all that stuff would all go in there. And then after that went in, then we dumped the chicken. That's when we cleaned the chicken um, shed out, put all that in there, and then we throw manure on it. Come springtime, man, that stuff was just so, ooh. <laughs> you just pull those pipes out and just we just go in there with with the shell, with scoop shovels and just load up and send moving it around move it out to the garden area but it was just uh we had a huge compost pile when we had all the cows and the chickens and all this all the all the all the livestock there and we just, all everything just went into this huge compost pile and come springtime the bottom it was cooked so good it's just you know you know you, you'd go to dig into it and you go well do i want to put this in the garden or i want to take all these worms and go fishing <laughs> Oh, and that's the thing i worms will do all the work for you so as long as you're a garden beds especially if you have raised beds if you can dig down i mean even just one pullback and you can count one or two worms so you could load it up with worms so yeah. i don't i don't do the traditional 
put everything in a pile because I've noticed that when I do put things in a pile, uh, my chickens like to kick it around everywhere anyway. So it's yeah. no longer a pile. Um, right. For those of you who don't have chickens, chickens don't like piles of anything. So <laughs> if you if you ever want to try an experiment, just go get some like pine shavings from Trader Supply or something and then just put it in like a mound in the middle of the coop. Right. I guarantee you they'll knock that thing down in half an hour. Right. So having a compost pile doesn't work with chickens because they just kick everything out anyway. And not to mention, I also have barn cats. So if you, you know, you have barn cats and you see a pile of something, they're probably going to poop in it. So it kind of undoes mm -hmm. the entire purpose of having compost because you got to keep on turning it to try to kill all their poop and they just use it as a bathroom. So uh, I figured it's just easier for me to dig a trench in my raised bed and just keep on doing it that way. And it so far it's worked out pretty well. That's an interesting point. I did not realize cats would do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, oh, uh, I got a funny story about compost bins. I mean, right. No, it's, it's, just saying what Cindy was saying there about no meat or meat byproducts in your right. compost thing. That's where the, that's where the chickens come in handy. Chickens and hogs will take care of all your meat meat or you know just about anything meat out there and stuff. So I was um, told no dog poo. Dog poo? Yeah, because it's a, it's a meat product. It's a bike product. Of yeah, yeah, oh yeah. You don't put you don't put uh, dog poo in your compost. It doesn't yeah. decompose right, anyways. Right. Well, so that's we the thing. Um, if you have worms, worms can take care of that poop for you. Because if you think about it, if it just takes a little bit longer than your traditional compost. So if you have dog poop, you can bury it or whatever in a, in its own little area, and I guarantee the worms will convert it to normal food within weeks if you have enough worms oh yeah interesting okay that's good to know yeah that's really good to know actually yep. yeah that's where we live there's no trash service so anything that i don't burn or and, and take the recycle i've got to haul to the uh the dump i don't want to be hauling a you know trash can full of dog crap <laughs> every couple of weeks well yeah. that, that whole composting bin we have some friends down here that were you know, they had grown up in Alaska, but they're growing up in the city and they wanted to do compost. They had bought the real, the nice who's your daddy uh, plastic bin on a little nice frame with the handle on it and the little door that opens up, you know, and they show me, yeah, look at our compost. I'm like, oh gosh, must be nice to spend that money on that thing. Within a, within like almost two weeks, the stuff that they had that thing half full because they were so religious about turning that thing on a constant basis and aerating it and turning it over. They had dirt within weeks, which blows my mind that you can make compost that fast. As long as you turn it, add the water to it and you aerate it and whatnot. Right. Yeah. But I'm a lazy composter. So I have a tall bin. I throw it all on the top. I have a door in the bottom about once every six months, I scoop out the stuff on the bottom, throw it back on the top and it all settles back down. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, with uh, my wife has besides the ball has um, stackable bin, you know, the, you know, it's about a thirty inch square um, and uh, about ten inches tall, um, three tier thing, and she just stacks it up as she adds more to it during the winter time. Mm -hmm. But things so on both the ball and the stack. Anytime she's working in the garden, she uh, pulls out a couple worms. She takes them over and puts them in there. Add, yeah. She adds worms to the compost pile religiously, right. and the worms, I mean, just even in the ball, you you, you roll it around, you know, uh, one day and you let it sit the next day, and the worms are just going through it. Right. And so, yeah, we take all of our wood chip shavings and with our chicken poo on it, because that's what we use for nesting material, not instead of straw, and we just put that right in the compost. And man, that stuff was on fire. It was yeah. awesome stuff. It's uh, it's actually kind of funny. Um, White family. You know, Mar <laughs> well, uh, Mar Martha's saying the same thing that I am uh, when it comes down to the, the dog poop. And, I, and it's, you know, you read about it. And I think the reason why you read it about it so many times online is because people are trying to cover their own, you know, rear end when they talk about, you know, poo and that kind of thing. Because it all depends on what you feed your dog or what you feed your animals. But, I mean, let's just be completely honest here. My chickens are omnivores. I've seen them eat lizards. I've seen them eat mice. I've seen them eat bugs. They're eating just as much weird stuff as my dog does. And I mean, I feed my dog, I basically make her food. So 
when it comes down to it, yeah, I don't want to just put her stuff because it's so hot directly in the garden anyway. But I mean, poo is poo, you know. I mean, like it. Yeah. If you just compost it down, that's the whole point of it. It's not going to turn into black dirt as fast as like banana peels, coffee grounds, and leaves. But you know, it's still going to turn into dirt. Everything does. That's interesting. So, I thought that the, uh, the 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 dog poo with the meat product, uh, it just the composition was different. But you're just saying it's it's all the same, and it just takes longer to compost. Well, it's fats. When you you can't compost fats like you would any other product, like a, a vegetarian product, because fats smell, and other animals are going to come in there and they're going to dig into it and try to go after it. Fats go rancid before they break down. You know what I mean? And okay. a lot of times, a fatty dog poo, they you know you're going to get fats. Obviously, fat is transferred to uh, to the waste. So that's where worms come into play because worms do all that stuff for you. Uh, you don't have to worry about anything, and as long yeah, your dog eats chicken poop also. Mine does too, and I got to keep yelling at her to stop it. Huh? Yeah. Uh, our, our 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 dog. Our, well, my daughter's dog. Downstairs, they got the they got and they got two cats, and they got a, uh, a cat litter box in the house that the cats use at night, and they it took them months to break that dog of eating the cat poop. Oh. Yuck. Now, Mine still does. <laughs> now, truffles. Here's, here's what's interesting is the, the cats out there go after the voles and the mice and they bring them over to the back door. Well, they'll leave it on the back. They'll eat part of it, leave it on the back, leave it out the, by the back door. And as soon as we let the calcifer out, the first thing that dog does is whoop, gone. And he fin polishes off all that. And then he goes out and he hunts the fields looking for more mice and voles and he's a, he's an australia uh shepherd and so but he he hunts the, the 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 voles and stuff and we just had a bad uh deal here a couple weeks ago the one cat barfed up about 12 tapeworms about that long oh and so yeah now that now they're on medication all the time because they're eating so many wild critters out there and getting the tapeworm you know tapeworms from the mice the voles the gophers and stuff like that so we're you know ha having to do the uh, medication now right so enriched refuge threw a little detail out there that i read about <laughs> activating your compost pile <laughs> <laughs> you guys probably it. That, that's the best that worm bed. That? You're talking about the best you worm bed. You know anything about that? This one here? Yes. No, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> the only drawback with that is the salt. If you do it too much, you're going to salt it down, and yeah. too much salt is going to be bad for your plants. But right. uh, urea, the processed version of urine, is actually a very, very, very good uh, nitrogen addition to your plants. So right. if you have, if you're growing things that require a lot of nitrogen, if you can make your own urea, uh, that is probably one of the best fertilizers out there. Right. And the, and the ammonia in the urine draws worms. It's like a dinner bell for them. Yeah. I can't stress it enough. I mean, I don't know if how many people watch Tyler from uh, Let's Talk About Prepping, but he's been hardcore into uh, vermiculture. And, you know, he's in Ohio, uh, Idaho, like y'all. And uh, he has been showing me all these weird facts when it comes to worms. I mean, I knew a, a decent amount, but I didn't know it like as much as he's showing me. But worms really do. Uh, everything and a lot of them are invasive unfortunately um, the European nightcrawler obviously they're not native here but they do such a good job they beat out the native worms but right. I mean when it comes down to compost turning if you don't have a whole bunch of worms in your raised beds or your where you're gardening you might want to do a little soil test to find out what's wrong because if worms don't even like it do you really think you're gonna be able to grow anything I and mean, think about it yeah then knowing all these cool Idaho people make you want to move to Idaho, Anthony? If it wasn't all the way across the country. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the, the only problem right now that Idaho has is all the uh, demon rats coming out of California, Washington, and Oregon coming over here trying to convert it to be like them. Not yeah. realize well, the reason why they're coming here is because it's not like like the California. <laughs> they right. do that here too. All the New Yorkers move down to South Carolina. They say, oh, it's so cheap down here. Gee, I wonder why. It's because we say no whenever that tax comes up on the voting ballot. Right. No. I don't yeah. want another tax for this reason. Hence why eight months from now, I am moving. <laughs> Next, soon as, soon as the snow melts, or maybe before, I, I don't know. I got to fix my road first. Once I get that road fixed, it's on. Yeah, then you'll be getting all kinds of good stuff when it comes <laughs> to this homestead thing. Hey, my wife is still in California. But the thing is, the problem is the demon rats that are there on the east side of the states, those th three states, are trying to convert, you know, free uh, constitutional state of Idaho into a commie state, too. But we've been, you know, they've been getting, you know, out of all offices as fast as we can. Unfortunately, some of them are now Say, oh, I'm a Republican. Uh, no, you're not. But that's another whole another conversation. <laughs> um, Martha, I've actually uh, I keep mine in the ground or in my raised beds. I don't do any kind of like separate farm. Uh, one good thing is I I had to go. I don't know how many people watched my most recent video, but I had to um, harvest my potatoes early because all this rain we've been getting the last couple weeks mm, has yeah. made the the, the funguses kind of kick up a little bit and uh, my potatoes got early blight i was going to harvest them in the first week of june anyway so i only really missed it by a few weeks um but when i was digging the potatoes because it had been raining literally every single day for like eight days straight wow. um, and you know they, they tell you to to dig your potatoes when it's not raining well i had no choice because the blight was there i don't want to affect the tubers because i don't know how many people have seen pictures of blight and then blight infected potatoes. Like it's not good. I'm not trying to lose my whole crop to blight. So I cut all the tops off and I tried to wait for it to dry out a little bit. Well, long story short, when I was digging up those potatoes, you have no idea how many worms I found doing that. So, I mean, obviously I have very healthy soil right. and all the stuff I've been doing where I, I mean, I don't know if I should admit this because some people, I don't know there's probably that one person who's like, no, don't do that. But I take bad meat that's been in the freezer that I kind of forgot about. Like say I bought fish and it was stuffed in the back of the freezer and it got yeah. real bad freezer burn or something like that. This is I good. bury that. Yeah. I bury that in my beds at the beginning of the season. Yeah. Oh, what well, fish is good. Uh, what, what's the difference between fish? You think you can buy fish emulsion all day long. It's you know, pureed fish, everything, right? What's the difference between yeah. fish protein and beef protein? It's yeah. the fats, the the different types of fats, and yes, yeah, Irish good. potato famine was from blight. So, uh, uh, Anthony, that's what, your, that video was the uh, crop rotation video that you were talking about your, yeah. with your potatoes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, give me a yep. second here. All right. So this but is the video. I, this, uh, this is the link to the video that Anthony was just talking about. Here. There we go. So it's coming up here slowly. There it goes. That's the uh, what he's talking about. His and you know, he, Anthony was speak, speaking some really good stuff on crop rotation, and that's something else that city preppers have no friggin' idea about <laughs> that they're going to have to if rotate their rotate their crops and stuff. I can't tell you how many people I came across just at something like Tractor Supply, and you have all these people who are making a garden for the first or second time. And all they're doing is planting fruiting vegetables. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I like tomatoes and peppers and squash just like everybody else. But you have to have some sort of variety because you're going to kill your soil if that's all you're planting. So, I mean, I'm, tomato, any nightshade is going to require. Say again? In my garden, I've tried to do that. I've tried to rotate my beans yeah. to a different row and my, my tomatoes to others. And I've... I, I alternate my rows east, west, and north, south every other year just to try and mix everything up a little bit. Um, so yeah. speaking of that, then, crop rotation, what's your opinion on uh, the back to Eden method? 
Well, <laughs> my wife. Okay, are we going to go for another hour tonight? <laughs> no. My, my wife was doing that. My wife was reading it, reading it, watching some videos on it, started to try it, and then she read a, She saw a couple other ones that agreed with what, with what she was seeing, and she was she was going. She was having problems with with trying to get the back the eating stuff to, to work. Uh huh. And it wasn't working in our property on our property there in Northern California, and so she took what jewels she could from it and it went back to what she and incorporated into what she was doing before and she said you know you know we you know you know if you've seen that go back in uh uh in the summertime uh on my, uh the video i put on my wife's garden put a couple of tours of my wife's garden there in california i mean it's a friggin' jungle of you know growth and stuff out there yeah and so yeah, we get it. that was good simple living they really started, they really went to that, but and her garden was just a massive jungle every year. And she was really adamant about that, but they would, but I, I, I want to say that they were constantly adding mulch to it every single year. And that was my impression was but back to Eden. Well, gosh, you're going to have to add mulch to at least, at least cultivate some mulch into that same row that you had your squash on last year, because like what you just said, Anthony, you're going to deplete your garden of the, of the those plants are going to, are going to leach out those minerals and, and whatnot out of if you put the same thing back um but even if you still rotate different plants different rows but you do the back to eat you still got to do something to supplement because it's just it doesn't make sense to me so i i did that this year and i still have seeds that won't come up and my garden is actually kind of struggling this year and then every year before that i was amending it with compost and i was tilling it and i'm granted i'm only tilling it maybe eight inches and then i would heap it up into my into my raised beds and every year my garden is it's, it's just a massive jungle by this time of the year and right now it's struggling and that's the last time i'm going to do back to eden i'm going to i'm going to till every year i think yeah um so this is just i'm not really sure on the the terminology back to eden is basically no till am i right yeah no till okay. Yeah. Um, I, as I thought, so I just wanted to make sure I'm not, you know, talking about yeah. something completely. Yeah. Off, I'll clarify I don't, a second ago. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm just, uh, cause I don't, I mean, some of these newfangled, you know, back to Eden. Well, I always called it no till. Um, yeah. it all depends on where you are. And I think uh, why I say that is because you always want to, you never want to have bare soil. Does that make sense? Like right. if you have bare soil, your soil is either, if it dries out too much, it's going to shed water or life can't really be sustained. Like worms don't like bare soil. So you're always going to want to have it covered with something. So if you can cover it with a cover crop, especially over the winter time, you know, good idea. The main thing is it's really geographically dependent because if you are in an area like North Dakota or Minnesota or somewhere cold that gets a very, very, very hard freeze, right. it'll be easier for you to have a, uh, back to Eden style or no-till garden because the frost is going to kill all your weeds. Everything's going to be dead from, you know, being frozen. If you're uh, in the southeast like me, I don't get that that horrible frost. So if I don't cover with some sort of cover crop or you know do weeding or or anything of the sort, I'm going to get all weeds, no garden. Does that make sense? Right. Right. So everybody's making so, that comment about mulch, and that's the whole idea is to keep the weeds down and whatnot. Yeah. Um, just keep the yeah. keep the garden from being bare. If you keep there, if, if as long as there's something on top of it, mulch weeds can't grow. Cover right. crop weeds can't grow. You yeah. have to keep the there is no bare soil. That's kind of I do that. I don't do I don't do till. I don't I never till my garden, but I always keep it mulched and covered so weeds can't grow. And whatever weeds do grow, I immediately pull them out because most weeds require compacted soil and poor nutrition, poor soil, because that's the whole purpose of a weed is to make that soil better because most weeds have a really long tap root. Look at dandelion. So they can, they're, they're basically uh, mineral miners. So they're pulling calcium, uh, magnesium from way down, you know, hardcore below the topsoil to try to enrich that topsoil. So if you have good soil anyway, and you mulch it you're not gonna have to worry about weeds and the weeds that do pop up you can literally grab them with two fingers and pull them out does yeah. that make sense 
Yeah. Totally that, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That, now, that's what, if you, uh, if you guys have a chance, um, check out the uh, Green Wizard's Guide by uh, Ron Netzel. That's exactly what, he what he's talking about is uh, as far as that, that is, you know, you know, the cover crops, the mulching and stuff like that. And he says, don't till, but turn your soil. So you get out there with a shovel, you just turn it over. And when you, you break and you break and soil break, when you break it up enough, so uh, the mulch and stuff can go down in a little bit, but you're not breaking up and disturbing all the microbes and you're not killing the worms that are there in the top uh, six inches or so that are now being right. uh, rotor tilled into uh, meat mulch. Right. You, uh, you, 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 you break it, you know, use like a, a potato fork and it's not a regular shovel. Right. That way you can turn, you know, turn chunks over and stuff, break it, soil, crack it so the, uh, the compost and stuff can go down in there and get food and stuff down into the soil so you can grow your soil. Now, one of the things my wife does out there in, you know, in the California garden uh, on her walkways and around all her raised planter beds and everything, she puts down a couple inches of straw down so it's not exposed. Sure, yeah. yeah and no, it, it breaks down and stuff. And every now and then, you know, she'll be walking out there, she'll stop and she'll move and there's a bunch of worms down and she pulls them, you know, moves them around, moves them over into the, into the forest planter beds and stuff. So she doesn't step on them all the time when she's out there walking. Right. They're in, you know, in yeah. they're in the straw mulch. And so I do, I do straw. And that's something else I got to do tomorrow is I got to head over here to the, um, the, the grain mill here. I got to pick up a 25 pound uh, bag of corn seed or sweet corn, and I got to get a couple bales of straw so that uh, where I'm putting in the garden out here, I'll be doing a video of it later. Um, I can put straw down around the corn. That, once the corn comes up a couple inches, I can put straw around it to help keep the weeds down. Hmm. And the uh, planting the pumpkins, the cantaloupe and stuff, I can put it down to help you know farther out, you know, to keep the um, the weeds down till the, the the vines can grow over it to help uh, keep the uh, weeds out. It's funny how much you can actually grow in straw because that's usually my mulch. I like to put mulch down over top of my bed. So say I got a, a my raised beds. If you ever watch my video, most of them are four by six, so four feet wide, six foot long. I'll put depending on when I harvest. <laughs> I always have some sort of mulch on there and usually nine times out of 10, my mulch is uh, straw, but you got to make sure you're getting certified weed free straw, because if you get the straw, it's got the seeds in it. You'll be oh, picking yeah. out weed all day. Uh, <laughs> so you want to make sure that you're paying attention. And if it's not uh, certified, you want to make sure you're paying attention to what you're putting down. So um, I cover my beds all the time. And when you plant your seeds, you want to consider that straw, that mulch as like soil. Because you can plant seeds in straw and they will grow. I don't. I don't know right. if you know that. So people uh, grow. Potatoes that's like why no-till works. Yeah, and my daughter that takes wet yeah. paper towels on a on a cook tray and she'll put the seeds in there. And once the seeds start sprouting, and she keep the, the the paper towels wet, then she uh, tears off the pieces and plants that with the seed because the seed is growing into the paper towel, and she can see which ones are germinating and and plant only germinating seeds that way. I mean, that's been done. Yeah, you know, the um, my mom used to do that, you know, back when I was a teenager, too. Squashes, I can tell you, because I'm doing it literally right now. I got melons actually from Martha at Old School. She hooked me up with some melons, and uh, that's what I did. I put a whole <laughs> bunch of straw down, and I put my melon seed in the straw, <laughs> and they grew completely fine. Because that straw is going to turn within one season. That straw is dirt. So, because, I mean, the worms do their thing. So... As long as it's not something like a tomato or a pepper that you're going to want to put deep in the soil so it's it, it's good for wind. Uh, mm -hmm. Vining plants, they don't need to be super deep, and they're going to spread the roots out the way they need to. So you can put the seeds inside the straw and be completely fine. All right, Michelle has a question here. Where do you get certified yeah. straw? I picked mine up at Tractor Supply right next to the uh, equine section. So... Um, I can't remember the name of the brand. I don't know if it's a local thing. I d don't quote me on that because I don't know. I'm in South Carolina. We might just have it like a supplier down here. But uh, if you get the ones from outside, they have like a hay bale section. Don't do that one because I did that one time and I was 
I literally went insane by how many seeds bloomed, and I just basically <laughs> had to solarize the whole bed. Uh, if you do get wheat or a uh, straw that's got seeds in it, all you got to do is solarize it, cover it with a black plastic and put it in the sun and the plastic is going to kill the seeds. Um, so, you know, keep that part in mind. You can still do that. Right. Yeah. The, uh, and uh, Ron uh, also recommends if you can get it, actually, you know, use um, alfalfa because that provide, it has stuff in it that, um, you know, provides nitrogen it breaks down, you know, really good. And it has some other enzymes and stuff in the alfalfa, which uh, he's, he calls it a natural plant steroid. Not some of this chemical steroid you get in like a miracle Grow planting soil mix. But, you know, it's natural stuff. Then it just it helps the plants just, you know, grow. Hmm. Interesting. So let me ask you this back to the, uh, the, the back to garden, uh, back to garden, back to Eden gardening method. When you're putting mulch, uh, a lot of guys put will put bark mulch or whatever on on top of their garden. Um, you grow your plants, and then you go through the winter time. The next spring, you just you leave that stuff there, and and, and the stuff on the bottom layers kind of just w turns the dirt. You just keep adding stuff on every year, basically. That's the idea. Basically, yeah. you're treating it like lasagna. So everything okay. that dies you're planting within that. Like I've legitimately seen people with no-till who will just grab a contractor and then smash everything down. So it's huh. laying like this, basically breaking the, what's it called? Uh, the stalks of whatever plant you put down. So if they planted buckwheat, they'll just roll over it so the buckwheat can't go to seed. And they'll just put little, they'll carve out a little hole, put the seed down in there, and that's their mulch. The last Incredible. year's plant are mulch. Old school prepper is going to forward me some videos. <clears throat> That's cool. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, see if I can find this here real quick here. That now, um, in response to Cecilia saying it's hard to find straw or can uh, cattle panels, um, I've seen a lot of, a lot of the channels that are using cat uh, cattle panels for their um, for you know for making rows for the tomatoes to go up and stuff. Um, don't under any circumstances, as far as I'm concerned, buy those cheap, flimsy, blankety blank, um, prefab ones you get at Home Depot or Lowe's for tomatoes and stuff. Those might be fine for peppers, but for if you got a real good growing uh, tomato plant, it's not going to work. What does work, and we've used it for years, trying to find it here. I use livestock fencing. Well, even yeah. better than that. Oh, come on, come on. Okay, here it comes up. So let me pull this up. We, we've used, and uh, we've used this for years and years and years. And let me share it here. All right, at Lowe's, you get, uh, because the, the Home Depot here doesn't have it. They just got the, the flat stuff. But the roll here of the, concrete reinforcement wire it's got um like six inch uh square squares on it and this stuff's hard hard to straighten out but works great on it is say you have like a um a 55 gallon barrel cut in half like i got a bunch of them you measure the uh the the outside diameter of it you measure on um, you take this and you measure around it and you take a bolt cutter and cut 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 you now have a five foot heavy duty uh, cage that'll support any monster tomato plant. And it works great and it'll, it'll last for years and years and years. Yeah. And, you know, like, all right, $109 for a five foot wide, 150 foot long roll <laughs> of wire. You can make a lot of five foot tall. Um, uh, tomato cages from this and you can do also you can do more than just tomatoes on it you can take it and uh you can stretch it out and use it like they do straight cat uh cattle panels and just drive a couple of the t-posts in and stretch it out there and have your um cucumbers and cantaloupe grow up on it if you do stuff like cantaloupe you get you have your wife save her old nylons 
and you cut off uh, a, a bit of nylon, tie a knot in the one end. When the cantaloupe is uh, so big, then you make a little hanging basket for it and let it grow in that nylon. It'll The nylon will expand for it and it'll support it and keep the weight off the um, the vine on the uh, that's growing over the uh, wire here. But yeah, we've used, we've used this stuff here for years and it works absolutely great for tomatoes because you got six inch squares on it here. Yeah. You can still get in there and you can control the paint. You can uh, break off the little uh, nubs between the uh, forks to make it grow tall before it starts bushing out. And so. Um, Cecilia, I, I want you to see if you can find any kind of information like on a simple Google search or something about the Florida tie off method. Because all you need to do is put two stakes in the ground and a string, and you can grow your tomatoes vertical that way. You don't need to put a cage. Um, you can put post, post, rope it, and then just alternate the side of the rope of the plant goes on all the way up. Yeah, and uh, that's what they do in these big fields here. They just grow rows of tomatoes and put one stake at the end, another stake in the, on the other end, and they just run wire. They weave it like this. In between right. each plant to keep them keep them up, so you don't need yeah. to do uh, cages. Not to mention yeah. one thing I just wanted to add: it depends on what type of tomato you have, because you can use those smaller cages for determinate tomatoes. Because determinate tomatoes, they grow to a certain size and they put out fruit, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, it's the indeterminate ones that are the ones that just grow till nine feet. Because I got some Cherokee purple tomatoes that grow nine feet every single year, and wow. even my my six footer uh, cages that I made with livestock panels um they grow well over that it's kind of ridiculous actually that's awesome yeah. the um uh da, da, da. mimsy's garden tonight her live stream tonight they were out in their garden and stuff and they were talking about get because she has something like 86 tomato plants out there and she's getting uh, uh the cattle panels the straight big long ones and to to do to, to you know, to grow it up because she's got so many tomato plants. Um, but yeah, so uh, this, the string version works. There's also a, um, uh, trying to think, um, the cargo netting that you get for your trucks, the, 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 um, some of the elastic stuff, you set up your, your T post and you stretch that out and your right. um, tomato plants will grow through that. Mm -hmm. And um and, and for your, you know, uh, Anthony was saying you put string or rope, you get like your quarter inch uh, blue um, nylon rope, at, you know, Harbor Freight or uh, Home Depot or Lowe's and you run that across and, you know, you want to have it fairly well tensioned, but on your put, but you got to reinforce your two, put your posts on the end so they don't just bend in. You need to, you know, you know run a stake, uh, a rope down, whatever, and stake it down to keep those right. two end posts straight. And then you can just, you know, run all your string through it and support it that way too. But right. see, for cages, uh, um, a lot of people I know is uh, they'll do the tomato plants in those half 55 gallon uh, barrels or the big tubs you get at Home Depot or uh, Costco. And so the 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 that uh, concrete wire. Uh, reinforcement wire works great for those because those are so, so strong and you, if you get like those you know your Cher Cherokee purples you know that's stuff strong and you know, if you need to you you know you overlap you put another one around on top of it and uh, use the uh, tie wire to hold it together and that puts you up 10 feet in the air let me ask you Anthony about your uh, your tie out your tie up method um, my, we just went to yep. some friend's house this weekend and, and he had done that with his, he had some, and he was telling, I had never heard the, the term determinate and indeterminate. And he had, he was, he's a mechanical engineer, a, a civil engineer. So he must've done his research and he, he was throwing all these terms at me and he's like, yeah, look at my determinate. And he, he was doing the tie up method. And I thought I had never seen that before. Um, do you have to go out there? And as that thing grows, you got to go out there and and kind of weave it on the string as it's grown. So you got you have to tend to it basically. It's not as bad as you think. Basically, if you go out there once a week and just run, cause I mean, in the middle of summertime, depending on what type of tomato you're growing, if you're growing, like I said, an indeterminate, if you're growing a determinate, you can just grow, you can set your stakes down, put your wire down and it'll, it'll grow up that and then stop. 
It right. goes to a set height and stops. Usually three feet, maybe four feet and stops. Right. And then it starts putting out tomatoes all at once. The indeterminates are the ones, the vines that just keep on going until the frost kills them. Like, like a pole bean. So, yeah, exactly. Um, that's the one that you're going to want to keep weaving. And you can go out like once every week, once every two weeks, and put another one there. Just enough to where it's not going to – the weight of its own tomatoes doesn't make it fall over. Does that make you. sense? Yeah. Yeah. And if you got a few plants on you, need to, you need to use like rope – not not some well, something strong. Five fifty cord works. Yeah. Five fifty cord works. Um, you know, simple nylon works. I'm sure clothesline would work, but uh, no. for me, um, a simple five fifty cord is what I use because I'm military. I got a whole bunch of it, and uh, I've done that a few times with just going out and cutting some saplings and pounding them in the ground, and then doing that. Like, cause it's, right. I, I like to do things for free. I don't like to spend money Cheap. on stuff I don't have to. Yeah. Yeah, baby, you're talking my language now. Free right. or cheap. <laughs> yeah. But I'm that's not what I mean, you know, buy things like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I like about the, you know, you know, for using the, the, that concrete wire, right. You know, 150 feet, five foot wide for, you know, $109. And those last eight, 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no problem. Yeah, I mean, the biggest problem is is uh, storing them and neck and uh, nieces and nephews and grandkids damaging and climbing on them. Oh, let's go climb on these, and all of a sudden they're flat. You know. Yeah. Well, the only drawback with the with the panels, and I'm just going to say this because I've I've experienced it unfortunately. Um, when I made, I went and bought, you know, a couple of years ago now, when I made my tomato cages with uh, livestock fencing, which basically like your six foot into the four you know four inch gaps for as you normally put up for like goats or something um well i had a really bad rainy season and my tomatoes caught a fungus like fusarium wilt that stuff's on the panels now if it touches the panels or the the fencing it's now on there so if you next year use those same panels there's a good chance that those tomatoes will catch what the tomatoes from last year got Does that makes yeah. sense okay mm -hmm. So you got to really clean those things down. So that's one thing I wanted to make sure I mentioned, because a lot of people put or leave their tomatoes in the ground until like the sun just completely kills them, uh, especially if they're determinants. Like, ah, whatever, just they'll, the frost will kill them. Right. Well, they might have a disease right before they go. So uh, if you're using the disposable method of just pounding stakes in the ground and rope, you don't have to worry about cleaning anything because you're probably not going to use that rope again the next right. year. Yeah. So. Now, um, you know, like Fisher's Low says, uh, bleach those buggers. But um, mm -hmm. if you have, um, uh, I, I showed it in one of my videos, uh, one of those uh, uh, propane torches that hooks up, you know, weed burner ones, you you know, just, you know, you know, you know, burn, burn the, the stuff, you know, the, the, the tomato, the vines and stuff, you just burn it off and let yeah. the ash go oh, down into, back into the ground, then it's, it should be clean. But you see, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to give a, an idea of like things yeah. you gotta, you know, you may not yeah. have paid attention to. It's like, oh crap, because I, I did that yeah. before. Like I had, I caught some, you know, like fusarium wilt, and then all of a sudden the next year I wouldn't plant everything. I didn't clean them, and my tomatoes automatically started showing. I'm like, crap, I should have done this, and I didn't think about it. Yeah. So learn from my mistake is why I'm mentioning it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And no. that's and that's the thing is, so it's like, um. A lot of the, a lot of these cha uh, channels of actual homesteaders and people that are actually doing the gardening, you can you know, these are the channels the city preppers need to be watching, not the you know talk to talk but not the walk uh, channels. I mean, if everything's hypothetical yeah. or theoretical, it's kind of like, come on now. I mean, you got to get outside at some point, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'm sorry I can put that foot up there. <laughs> Fishes the lobes to go is going full tilt on it. Uh, what, what, <laughs> flamethrower. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you can get uh, Elon Musk sells flamethrowers and they're not illegal. It's pretty amazing. You don't have to permit or anything. Um, <laughs> which blows my mind. Uh, you know, back to that 
issue of the uh, you know the the channels that are not walking the talk. You know, I you know we have we have we know there's fake channels out there that are you know pretending to be off grid or pretending to be a homestead, and then they you know are living in mom's house with the power cord running behind the cameras or you know whatever, uh, or they really are on grid or whatever. But I. I it's kind of like that show Doomsday Preppers. Let's just let's just stay away from our, our fellow YouTube creators for 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 a second. But talk about Doomsday Preppers. Again, the show was dramatized, overly dramatized, and painted preppers in a in a really negative light. Uh, but there was still a ton of good stuff to learn and a lot of ideas to pick up, and some of it was legit stuff. So uh, I, I'm not going to say you know the channels out there that are that are not. If they're just talking, sitting there talking about it and making a video about how to do something, and you never see them actually out in the garden, I, I you're, you're right. But if we see them out there in the garden, but they're really living in, you know, their their on grid house off camera, but they're actually, but they're out there gardening, I, I think there's still a lot of, I, you can pick up a lot of value in that. So I wouldn't shy away too much from all that, you know. Yeah, I'm, I got in trouble I'm, last year for putting my foot in my mouth for talking about fake channels, and <laughs> so I kind of learned my lesson. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely not trying to say, you know, a certain channels. I'm not trying to name anybody, but I'm just saying if yeah, you're watching sure. something and you see people never going outside yet, they're everything they talk about is in theory. Right. You might want to take their opinion a little bit less weight than somebody you see constantly outside Actually doing showing. something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Totally. Yeah. Now, like uh, the, uh, um, Courtney's and no, I don't have a video. Here. Pretending to be off grid. Why? Because they're trying to get more clicks. Pretending to be what? <laughs> <laughs> I am not going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> Stay away from that. I put, like I said, I put my foot on my up to my knee last last year. At that, I gotta let my boxer in. She's whining. I don't know if you guys can hear. Yeah. And I'm, I, I definitely don't want to try to make any like enemies with certain channels or whatever, because there's a lot of like zealots out there or zealots out there that'll go hardcore just because they don't know you. Um, yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to cause any kind of a ruckus, yeah, but uh, I just, I wish there was, well, wish there was a way that uh, the drama of all by themselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wish there was a way that like the algorithm could you know, highlight the ones that are actually out there doing stuff and not just always the talkers. Cause if there's that one video of you with a good rant or, you know, you got a really funny whatever, and then 2000 people find you off that one video. And it's like, do you really know more than the person with 500 is because you've got more subscribers? Not necessarily. That's the flip side. Yeah. yeah. That's the downside yeah. to the fakers out there is that they, they definitely take viewers yeah. away, you know? Well, you know, along this thing, so there's, there's one thing, there's one TV program just ticked me off no end. And, you know, he's really, he's, 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 he's all into the, um, the money right now and it has been for years. Um, he's got, you know, all sorts of, you know, you know, he has this, you know, has gotten Gerber to make, uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm going to name them the Bear Gills knife, and then you got the Bear Gills clothing and stuff. And he got dimed out by his own crew when he was out someplace. All right, we're going to be setting up here. We're standing, and as soon as the camera was off, they all packed it up, went back into the motel, and he spent and he had a steak dinner and slept in the motel bed. Went back out the next morning. Oh, it was a cold night last night, you know. And guys like that. Um. Or uh, to me, I mean, I will never believe anything he says because he is now so much BS hype and he's been dimed out that he just ruined a whole lot of uh, uh, a credibility for guys that really do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it definitely painted like like the preppers thing. Doomsday definitely painted preppers in a bad light, and he definitely he uh, he definitely painted uh, the survivalists in a, in, a, in a light. But on that note, the one that I started watching first was Les Stroud, the Canadian, and his one week survival trips. Love that guy. I actually he has a YouTube channel. I hate to say that and and have everybody go over to see Les Stroud on his YouTube channel, but he's he has really kicked it up a notch on his YouTube channel and sharing stuff and. 
He is absolutely 100% legit. I actually had heard little cat, little, uh, uh, little, um, deviation here that he had gotten divorced or his wife left them because he was so involved with his, with his survival stuff. Um, and unfortunately couldn't, couldn't manage the fame and the family life at the same time, but he's still doing the survival stuff and doing great tips and everything else. So I love yeah. that. So I learned a ton from him. Yeah. I got, I got, I got his books and I love his books. Yeah. He's less is a neat guy. Yeah. Well, I think that's, the, uh, <laughs> I think that's the thing. Um, a lot of us, I, I work, I'm a lot of us aren't going to sit out there and try to pretend that something we're not. If you just completely tell yeah. somebody, Hey, this is how you do something, but I'm going to go spend the night over here. I'm not actually going to do it. People wouldn't give you so much crap. And it's when you pretend that you're actually doing something like I see people, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of baking bread. Like I've been making bread and baking bread from scratch for, you know, over a decade, like all different kinds, uh, it's just something I like to do in my spare time. I just, I, it makes me feel, you know, calm down. And I can see when you bake bread, like if you show me pictures or you're like, Hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Look at this bread I baked. Like you bought that. I can tell when you buy it versus <laughs> when you make it, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. I now, mean, it's not all the time, but yeah. you know, I, I've seen it before and it's like, why, why would you do that? Like, do you have a brick oven or, a or anything like that? Say again. Do you have a, a brick oven or a pizza oven or anything like that? that no, I'm 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 building one of those uh, as we speak, but I'm just trying to source right. more brick right now. That's cool. I want to build one of those too. Those are cool. Wood fired pizza and bread. Oh yeah, good stuff. I got lots yeah. of plans when I move up to Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Now, guys, there's a channel out there with a teenager on it, uh, Gavin. I can't remember his channel name. GM just, Survival. GM Survival. Yes, I got to go back check. Cause I, is he still putting out videos? I haven't, I haven't seen, seen a video in a while. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure I've been unsubscribed from, I got to go check that out. Uh, GM yeah. survival. But um, yeah, he get you know, this kid gets out there and he goes through and he's teaching adults how to do stuff. Hmm. And he's really great. And so, I mean, you know, he goes out there and he's does the stuff out there in you know, out there in the rain and stuff like that. I'm trying to see if I can find him here. My computer work is getting a little warm here and slowing down. It's only, you know, it's getting a little warm here. So, you know, G M S U R V I V survival. I got a funny stare. Sorry about Bear Grylls in a second. I, <laughs> when you, when you get finished this, go, go ahead and tell the story while I'm looking this up. <laughs> exactly, Martha. Exactly. What's that? I was saying exactly Martha. She made a comment. I was, and I, that's exactly who I'm talking about. She knows. Yeah. 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 Everybody knows we're talking about bear girls. Might as well just say it. Uh, Fishes and Low said he was, you were wondering why they, people didn't like bear. And, and I, I have to go back to what I was just saying about even, even the turd buckets, you, you can learn something from. And a, a perfect example is I had watched that show before he became Ill, illegit. And there was the one episode where he's out in the desert and he and he and he catches the rattlesnake and he skins the rattlesnake and then ties it in knot and he pees in it and that's what he uses for his survival liquid. He throws the, the snake skin of pee around his neck and he's trudging through the desert. But I'll never forget how to skin a snake from that show. I had always suspected, but I never did. I swear that summer I took my son and with a couple other dads from church with their sons. And we were up here in the local mountains and we ran into some black Arizona rattlesnakes and we actually killed one and they didn't know how to clean it. And so they're all, and we actually had a little bit of reception. So they were all online trying to figure out how to clean this, how to skin the snake and clean it. And I'm like, guys, you just do it like this. And I took it and I turned it inside out like a sock and they looked over and like, whoa, <laughs> I said, didn't you guys watch Bear Grylls? <laughs> so, even the, 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 the goofy shows, you can learn something from, and we ended up eating it. Tasted like chicken. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, I was out in uh, in Africa, and I found some camel poop, and I took a shower with camel, and I was wringing it out. And I was kidding; I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't drinking. You weren't wringing out the poo and drinking the water out of it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just pulling a bear goes. No. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. I'm going to end this with one one little story here. Um, for, uh, for years and years, I've heard this and this is, this is a myth that goes back decades, centuries, 
rattlesnakes do not travel in groups. My dad was out pheasant hunting out in a, in a, in a uh, I can't, it wasn't corn, but it was, um, it was a, 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 about like three foot high, you know, vegetation, you know, uh, commercial, uh, commercially farmed thing. And he's out there and all of a sudden here's a of the rattle and there's a rattlesnake there. And he starts to step back and here's one behind him. And there's another one over there and there's another one over there. And so finally he just stopped and waited until they, and they were all moving around and he started, you know, bam, bam, bam. Twelve rattlesnakes. Wow, he was in a nest of them. And um, out in the farm field. But, uh, and you know, the reason why I also bring this up is, you know, he, yeah, he always tells stories because when he was eight years old, he stepped off the front porch of his house in Indio, California, down by Salton Sea and got bit in the ankle by a rattlesnake. Oh, so he hates rattlesnakes, and he goes, you know, he goes. Anyone tells me that they don't travel in groups is full of, and and he went on with several expletives. But, anyways, so we have been on here for two hours now, guys. I and gotta, I gotta, I gotta address something real quick there. Um, Enriched Refuge was uh, re referencing an, a certain Alaskan family that has a certain uh, TV show that are living in Oroville, Loomis, Washington now, and they're still filming their show. Uh, I have not personally met them, but I know three families personally that have been on that show, and they are absolutely 100% legit. Those guys uh, work very, very hard and are constantly moving around. And I, I think I left, I left the comment, if you saw that comment there, Enriched, but uh, I'm pretty sure they're, they're, they're down here and they're living in Washington simply because they're down here in the lower 48 so much. And it just saves a lot of time having to travel all the way back and forth to Alaska all the time. So, um, but I know three families personally that had were on that show, and they're like, "Yep, those guys worked their butts off the whole week we're here, and it was not it was not a bare grills situation in any way, shape, or form." And they are very grateful for what they did. So that's one reality show I really enjoy and have a lot of respect for. Is are the Rainies? <laughs> I'll just throw it out there. Yeah, was that is that the um the uh, uh, ox oxley and uh that family no 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 That's no no, the, no. Uh, oh, they, they from... talking about in rich is talking about the alaskan um oh that's who you were talking about well i i know i know ox and his family um okay have no, a lot of land up there and land down here too and some members come down here live down here but uh, uh, Ox himself stays up there the entire time. Yeah, no, that's another show that's legit. Um, I think uh, you know what I who I think in Rich is talking about is the um, the one family that had the the, 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 the goofy kids that were running around acting like uh, uh, Bush, Alaskan Bush people. Yeah, those guys they actually got in trouble from the Alaskan authorities getting their Alaska check and they weren't really true Alaskans or something like that. They they, yeah. they had to go to court over that. I think that's who he's probably talking about. All right. All anyway. right. Yeah. So before we, before up, we yeah, so uh, for wrapping this up, a couple of little things here. So Tuesday, uh, Tactical Tuesday is going to be sanitation in and after uh, Tuaki, which is the end of the world as we know it, or a SHT event. And next Friday, we're going to flip this around, and it's going to be what – homesteaders need to learn from city preppers. That's going to be a controversial one. Because there's some things that city preppers know and learn and study that homesteaders in these times need to start learning. There are some certain issues and stuff out there too. Um, you know, just you know, such things as, you know, I'm just, you know, you know security issues, um, forming alliances, you know, just, just a bunch of little things like that. So uh, we'll, we'll talk on that then. And I, I so just hope watch some popcorn because I don't, I just don't, I don't see a whole lot. I don't think homesteaders can learn anything from city, city prep or city slickers. Oh, they absolutely can. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So? Oh, yeah. Let me put it this way. I'll, I'll throw you an example. Who, who, who is more into the, into the new techie stuff? 
city preppers and anything new, and all the new technical stuff. And some of that technical stuff is some stuff that I know some home, home sending channels are picking up on and are incorporating some of the new tech stuff into their homesteads. I know I see some awfully big homesteading channels out there that have been doing YouTube for a lot longer than any of us and are humongous channels. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but they are. Up, you're going to have to tune in till next week. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, stopping in tonight. Hope uh, uh, you learned something. We, I know we learned some stuff from the side chat there, some information going on there. And thanks for everybody for participating. You guys are a great, great crowd. Yeah. And I'd like to remind everybody uh, tonight, uh, re please remember Dave of uh, – Southern Ohio prepping in your in your prayers. He's uh, ha going through a tough time uh, health wise right now. Um, prayer, man. Yeah. All righty. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess that's it. And we'll see you next time on Tuesday.